Everybody. Welcome back to the Coach's Corner. I'm your host, as always, Mike Murray. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by two coaches from Team Elite in San Diego, California, Coach David Marsh and Coach Javi Sosa. Welcome to the program, guys. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to have you. And, and Javi, this is the first time we've met, and you've been incredible in the planning and the organizing for this podcast today. So thank you so much for all your work in advance. I wanted to start today because we, we are talking about uh, sets and practice and some of the things that we love to do in a workout. And I know you guys have an expanding team in Southern California right now in the San Diego area. And it's going to be really exciting to see what comes out of that area. Traditionally, you know, with so many pools there, we've always thought maybe we'd see some more Olympic trial qualifiers coming out of that area. And now that you've got a footprint that's expanding there, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about what Team Elite is doing in the San Diego area. Yeah, it's, it's you know, the, when I first came out here, I, I brought Team Elite out hoping to sort of plug it on top of a, uh, of a club program uh, that was here, but uh, there wasn't a lot of interest in that. So uh, I did start with a college team and they weren't letting me start a swim club uh, and they weren't real very receiving of the team elite concept being with us. So that didn't work out either. Uh, so we started our own team as is called the team elite stingrays at first. And then during the quarantine, uh, there was the pool space was highly limited and uh, ran into be, befriended a man named, named, named Pete McVeigh. Pete's a, a Navy SEAL, current Navy SEAL commander. And he's a uh, uh, guy that as he gets stuff done kind of guy as no, no surprise to you. And he's uh, swam at Tennessee, so he's an SEC guy, but from out here in California, uh, swam for Bruce Patmos up in uh, Santa Clarita growing up, so got great coaching when he was a young kid, so he understood what great coaching is for a uh, developmental athlete. And, and so we spent a lot of time during the COVID time. He would uh, help us get access to some 50-meter water, uh, different places. We had a backyard pool and we used the Navy SEAL base a little bit uh, where we could, when we could get in there and find some time to use it. We had a lot of long conversations and conversations that ended up being about, you know, what does it take to, to have a, an excellent club? And you, maybe no surprise to you, Mike, but uh, certainly I'm more a quality oriented coach and, and someone who believes in, you know, mightily in stroke technique, uh, heavily printed by the early days watching Paul Bergen at National Aquatic Club and seeing uh, not just Tracy Calkins go up down the pool with like a 10, 10 out of 10 technical skills, but also the people in the lanes next to her and the people in the lane next to her, like they all look like they were swimming about the same way. So at a, in many ways in Las Vegas, and then when I was coaching Las Vegas Gold, and then uh, at Charlotte when I was coaching Swim Mac, the, that was sort of the goal was to, to get a, a team to where the, the, the technical aspects were taught in a sort of uniform way. And then as they got older, they got, they could develop their own sort of tweaks as to how they swim and can, you know, one of my most proud moments was walking in probably six or seven years into the, the swim back job and walking onto the deck and uh, with Russ Castle and John Fadina and some, some excellent coaches that were working with the younger guys and, and, uh, and just walking along the deck and, looking at the group and seeing zero swimmers overreaching and backstroke, seeing zero swimmers pulling back too far and breaststroke, seeing zero freestylers not using a six beat kick. Everybody was using a six beat kick. So those are things that to me are easy to understand, hard to implement. And if you don't, you know, build in expectations, if that's not your expectation, then athletes will fall short of your expectation if you don't require that expectation to actually come to fruition. So that's kind of where we got to. And, and so I'd say that's what uh, we uh, are working on creating here. We've combined the Stingrays with the Corn Out of Swim Association. Corn Out of Swim Association, probably the most storied program in San Diego uh, with the, the Mike Troy. He put a number of Olympic, Olympians on the Olympic team. Uh, culturally, though, in the last you know many years, you know, driving over the Coronado Bridge has, has sort of been a dividing line. So people haven't really driven over the bridge to get to practice. 
we are sort of changing that now because we're driving over the bridge every single day for team elite practice because that's where the pools are that we have been allowed to use and and even post covid it seems to be uh, the most uh, inviting, you know, area of town for you know, at least for some of the 50 meter sessions like today. So we started off with, you know, a small group of swimmers and now it's gotten bigger and bigger. And just this weekend, we had a lot, we did a shave meet and had a lot of kids just crush best times. And we were able to get CIF, the, the high school, some version of that meet off the ground and had a lot of the kids that are with uh, Coronado Swim Association, Team Elite, we're calling it CSDE. Uh, just really bust through big times, even though they've had, you know, abbreviated training. And finally, we had an Olympic trial qualifier, uh, a Yale, a Yale commit junior in high school that uh, made the 50 freestyle. And so that's not only the second, I believe that's only the second San Diego high school kid that's made Olympic trials so far. And, uh, and Mike, you can know how sort of frustrating that is for me. I mean, at Swim Mac, we had I don't know, we had the most at the last trials and it was like 30 some odd high school kids had made the trial cut. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a, you know, we're, we're working on it. There's a, there's a number of other clubs in town working on it. Uh, but, you know, we're trying to focus on doing it the way that we want it done. Just two weeks ago, we hired Joey Garcia as the new head coach for CSTE. Joey is, his background is, a, is a, mostly with Mark Schubert of Mission Viejo. And when I asked Mark, you know, about Joey, he said, you know, he's literally the finest assistant coach he's ever had. That's pretty powerful for Mark Schubert to say. So I said, I think he just got the job on that comment. Uh, and he's, a, he's an explorer. He's uh, he, as much as, you know, Mark and, and my philosophies might not be similar in coaching. It, the, uh, the chance to have Joey here with an open mindset and taking the sort of the best of what Mark does with maybe what we do, what I already do some and sort of merging those two things seems to me to be almost be a perfect thing for a developmental high school kid who does need the work. They do need some background at the same time. We want them swimming you know, really perfectly. And so Team Elite has, has sort of been on top of all that. And so or in and around that, there's a Team Elite group that's training about 12, you know, people trying to make medals in the Olympic Games. Uh, six of them, I believe, are Americans, then some internationals. And then this year we started a, a, a college contingency group and that's a group of now, now what's turned out to be about 30 swimmers who've moved mostly from the Ivy League schools, Williams College, uh, some of the private schools where they canceled their season. And uh, they've been out here in uh, Coronado all, all year. And, uh, and again, just shaved last weekend for a meet and swam really well, had lots of, uh, lots of great, great swims and a ton of people just off the Olympic trial cut. So that's probably the other piece we've done. And, and we're co contemplating doing that into the future. It seems like there's a lot of we get a lot of requests from gap year students or college kids are sitting out a year and there, there isn't, you know, probably a more beautiful place to sit out for a year and train than Coronado. And uh, with the connection with Team Elite and with the connection with CSTE, I think it makes a, a robust team. And fortunately, uh, Pete McVeigh has been able to secure enough pool time in Coronado to make these things work, because if it wasn't for that, we'd be in big trouble. And, uh, and, and fortunately, we're not in big trouble. We're, we're doing well and, and even thriving in, in, in this situation. That, that's really great to hear. And, and we are sort of the back end beneficiary of some of the, the college program that, that you started out there with. We have Kyle Verstandig out there training with you guys. And boy, did he just have a huge meet. And so yep. uh, thank you very much for that. And thank goodness you have Javi here to help coordinate all of these different pieces. And uh, Javi, what are some of the things that you've learned early on here working with Coach Marsh? And obviously you swam for Sam Freeze. So, you know, you, you already have a good coach's brain as an athlete. So what are some of the things that you've learned early on here working with Coach Marsh? Uh, definitely. Uh, first of all, the attention to detail from David is impressive. Uh, seeing the little things that he sees is number one. And then he liked to see, especially at the club level kids, uh, things uh things done very well until we progress to the next one. So we can spend three, four weeks on one little thing, we get it done, and then we move on to the next one. So kind of be very persuasive on how we do things. So be very methodolic, methodical about it, you know? So it's a method to everything. That's really neat. And, you know, we know Coach Freeze was so creative in some of the things that, that he did at many of the different teams he played a role on. 
what, what are some of the creative ideas that you learned swimming for Coach Freeze? I think he was very good at reading the spirit of this, his, his athletes. So uh, yes, in the swimming side too, but he was very, a little bit more holistic as, a, as, a, as the view that he got from his swimmers. So he walking into the pool, like somebody didn't look that well, and he would just like, just turn around, go take a nap, come back in like a couple hours, you know? So uh, if, if today I coach something like that happens to you, it's like, oh, this is weird. But he was that strange that he only read you in the water, but also ice out of the water. So kind of spiritual, holistic uh, reading from, from athletes. So that was pretty interesting to learn too. That's a, that's a great perspective that, that you saw there. And, and that takes years to develop. So kudos for you for, for seeing that. Um, to get us into our conversation today, and uh, you know, Dave, you mentioned earlier, John Fadina, he's been my roommate at a couple national select camps. Great guy, a little shout out to John. So it's 2014, it's about this time of year, Dave, I'm out with four or five of my kids in Mesa and we got there late. And so we were doing a training session, you know, it's April, so we're still training really hard. We're doing a training session before the Grand Prix. And my kids are looking and they're like, Coach Mike, Ryan Lochte's over there and Tyler Clary, they're sliding down the slide and then sprinting <laughs> to the wall. We're in, the, we're in the middle of like four, 400 descent, you know, and, and actually Mi Michaela was there too. So it's kind of funny how things come full circle, but um, that's, that's kind of been a running joke with our senior elite team since that time is why can't we train like those guys with, with coach Marsh, go down the slide and sprint. Um, but what I wanted to ask you guys first was, and I'll start with you, coach Marsh is, Talk to me about, you know, some of the considerations that you keep in mind when you're writing a set. So what are some of those first inclinations that you have when you're ready to put pen to paper or, or you, you break out the laptop? Yeah, I don't break out the laptop, but it's uh, usually a, a grease board and a uh, marker that I usually running around trying to find an extra marker and an, and an extra grease board. I will say that's one of the problems with outdoor pools that, that, that the the uh, grease boards are harder to maintain and keep in a place without the wind blowing them away. Uh, and and I, that's where I do sort of create in my mind the, the workout. Um, considerations, uh, it's, it's a great question. The considerations would start with what, the, what is the plan for the season, the window of time we're in, the, the weekly cycle, and then the, uh, you know, and then where we are as a group. So evaluating where we are in the, the previous weeks, whether that be through blood tests and having sort of hard numbers, or whether that be through looking at eyeballs, uh, like Sam Freeze was so good at, or uh, just feeling what the group is 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 looking at. I mean, I'll adjust things. I adjusted a set this morning where we were, you know, one of our main sets we do every week is a kick set countdown, and we're down to, of course, uh, only like four fifties kick all out now, uh, being this close to trials, but. Uh, we were, I took it out because it was not, you know, we weren't, they, they hadn't done, they had done a full exhaustive practice. And then I wanted to focus on what we had just done and redo, redo some little pieces of it. So we stayed right there. So in a, in, and before I'm, you know, basically right at set at a time. And generally there's two sets per day that I focus on. Usually there's a main set and sort of secondary set after the warm up. Uh, sometimes the, the main set or the secondary set will also involve the preset. Uh, I like a lot of exploration during the warm up and preset. So they, the, the goal is for them to revisit things they've been working on. Uh, I do think that to start to practice with the best possible technical swimming, uh, feeling the best relationship with the water, uh, being sensitive to how you feel that day in the water and, and making slight adjustments is the, is the setup. Then there's a, sort of the energy we, we want from them, whether that be so a little more aerobic oriented or anaerobic. Uh, then off of that, we'll usually adjust the last set to keep pounding if they're, they're handling it. And it's in that time of the season where let's uh, now nail their legs and we go after a hard kick set, or we might pull back some and okay, now go kick to swim with fins on, depending on what we're seeing, or it might be by the individual, it might be adjustments by the individual. You know, obviously the larger the group, the less you can rely on breaking out. Uh, we're fortunate to have Peter Lynn out here with us, who's just a brilliant mind in, in the world of coaching. So he often will give feedback or input when he's there. He's there about three times per week. And that's very valuable as well. And, and really count on the coaches to be paying attention to the details of the athletes and how they're doing. 
So again, in reviewing it, the first thing is what's the sort of this, the phase of the season we're in. Secondly, what uh, portion of the, the three or four week cycle, depending on what, how many, how many weeks we're in a, a weekly cycle we're in and then what the week looks like. And so breaking it all down to that, then it comes up to the, that session's practice and even more specifically to more or less a set at a time. Sure. And I know we have some examples and Javi, do you want to bring those up? I can also bring them up if you need me to. Okay. Looking at uh, sort of a typical workout here. Here's a middle distance set. The pro version, uh, oddly enough, is sometimes actually a little bit lighter than the college version because they're a little bit older and, and oftentimes the, the pros, especially on the sort of the bottom side of the middle distance group, they don't need the volume. They have the, they have the neurological knowledge their body has the skills built in they're not trying to hone things quite as much as let's say a college or a high school uh, athlete might be but you know this would be a typical set you know 200 uh, team lead tumbles that's really the original that would have been Tennessee tumbles that I remember from uh, from the old uh, the old days with uh, the Tennessee crew and then we took it as a tiger tumbles when I was at Auburn now the team elite tumbles fortunately the T has stuck so we got we got to stick with the T uh, and that's where basically you go, go under the water before the flags, you do a turn under the water and push off uh, on your back beyond the, beyond the flags before you rotate over. And then we'll go into some kind of a pull combination. So we don't do a lot of, of pulling, but when we do pull, we want uh, the tempo to usually be pretty strong. Uh, we'll set up the pull is all about just setting up the good grip on the water. Uh, we don't really want the uh, body line to drop too much. So if we do strap only, it's only 25s at most 50s. Uh, buoy and strap is just to, to mostly work on big hold and accelerating to the pull pattern. Uh, and then uh, the, ne the next, they'll pop on fins. This is something we do with everybody and often. I love uh, 50s, especially long course with fins freestyle kick and uh, trying to look like a dolphin cruising in the ocean. Not cruising, but going fast in the ocean. So guys, even high school guys, should be able to go 27s, 28s on that. And the ladies, you know, 28s to 30s. Uh, they're really sort of all out efforts, but if they do it right, their whole body's just moving through the water rhythmically. And uh, they're, they're using their everything from the tip of their fingertips through their head connection, their hips coming up, their lumbar spine rising up. And, uh, and they're pounding their legs. So it's a nice, a nice little set there. And then we'll finish it up with, uh, with, a, with some kind of kick. Just to, This is obviously a kick emphasis set. And then uh, with, with the kicks, we'll work on uh, some hypoxic component during this set. So usually the sets are some version of combinations of, of, uh, of breakdown. So it's not just all swimming or all pulling or all kicking. They'll be often variety of strokes and variety of equipment used. Uh, you know, I, I definitely am a coach that believes keeping the workout interesting is really a key part of having high engagement. Having high engagement leads to uh, more buy-in from the athletes and the more they can, you know, sort of be bringing their best version emotionally and physically to the, to the practice the more likely we're going to have a, a really different, you know, in, uh, outcomes that will cause a bigger difference. Uh, I'll let Javi talk about how these get adjusted sort of down to other groups or over to other groups. But just to, just to say this would be like one set within a workout. So this would this wouldn't necessarily be a whole workout. This would probably be a 45 minute workout that would we might go through uh, three times. And, and uh, this would be. This would be on a day that we're looking at probably sort of pink to red focus. So maybe uh, more of a, an aerobic practice with a touch of threshold in there if they're doing it right. And uh, maybe even descending by rounds. So, so that's pretty much like a, for us, that'd be a Monday normally or Friday afternoon uh, would be this kind of typical set, uh, set that sets them up for the week or, or a set that's in between when we're doing a heavy fast up on Thursday and we're going to hit them again on Saturday. So it's something uh, in between like that. I love it. <clears throat> it looks like a fun workout. It looks like something that's going to engage the athletes. And I know Javi, Javi knows how to adjust these for the different groups. Javi, do you want to jump in and talk about one of your favorite adjustments here or your favorite sets that we shared? Yes, absolutely. So definitely when we go to college, so while my brain goes to is like, 
short course. So we start going to paying a little bit more attention to detail. For example, do not breathe out of the wall. Uh, their under their finishes, their turns, everything have to be as perfect as they can. So my detail orientation is go more to underwaters, turns, and breakouts. You know, so everything is gonna fall on that. Uh, for the pros, it's a little bit different because they try to go long course, try to get their stroke a little bit longer. Uh, so that will be the college version. And then for the high school version, it's a mini version of the whole set, but a little bit more simple. So they can nail just one detail and stick to it. You know, for example, the, the kick for them, uh, we kick a lot. Uh, one of the philosophy fundamentals for David uh, is very strong kickers as uh, high schoolers. Uh, so for us, our kicking and our high school crew have to be very strong. So that was one of the good ideas that we have to hold as a group, as a organization. Our high school senior kids have to be very good kickers. So on this side for the and on this set for the high school version is more oriented or to our kick. That's great. And one thing that I know about the program that Coach Marsh has always put together is how much you value athleticism and kinesthetic awareness. What are some things, Javi, that, that you've learned about developing some athletes and not just not just water swimmers, not just athletes we're thinking about in the water, but the full well-rounded athlete while you've been working with Team Elite? Absolutely. Uh, for sure, like a quick example, the runners, you know, a very, very well executed runner is a very, you're showing so much, so much your athleticism. You know, how, how you can run and how you can swing and you can sprint and jump and how right away you hit the water, you're right away into swimming because you want to utilize that speed that you have on. So just one simple thing, it, it shows you a lot of athleticism. And then, for example, we start doing uh, runners with our college group and they were not the best. So right away, we're like, well, you're supposed to be in college. You're supposed to be, a, you're supposed to be an athlete, you know, and you need to do this right. So we went through the process of teach them again how to do a very well run and then do a big swing and a good jump and right away to their swimming. So I think the athleticism, you're correct, uh, especially in short course yards, it's very, very important to have athletes jump into the pool. No doubt about it. And Dave, why is physical literacy such an important piece of the, the structural framework of your program? Well, at the end of the day, swimming is one of the most athletic things you can do. And we're doing it in an environment that's very foreign to the human body. I mean, God didn't make any of us to be swimmers in the water. We're supposed to be on land running away from dinosaurs. So it's a, you know, I think when you think about taking a, a human and putting them in the water, you know, it's really evident when you're out here in California, you know, and Javi and I both surf and they would be sitting out there on the surfboards and doing all this stuff. And there'd be seals swimming underneath us or dolphins coming by us. And yeah, we really suck at swimming. <laughs> I mean, every, every human isn't good. So, I mean, I had Ryan Lochte, who's maybe one of the most aquatic guys in the world of the history of the world, but he wouldn't hold up to, to Nemo, much less than any dolphin that's coming cruising by. So what we're trying to do is really ultimately get them to have a high level of water acumen, but taking the athleticism to that ability. Now, obviously in short course, it's way different because you, you power off each wall. And that's why you're seeing the big difference between the guys in college that are going 129s and the 200 freestyle, but they can't go 146 and 200 meter freestyle. Uh, it's, it's the, they're, they've learned how to use the power off the wall again and again and again. And so, and so that's going to be even more athleticism. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, Javi is a, a strength conditioning coach as well. So he actually works with the guys in the weight room and, and does a lot of bounding work with them, a lot of connection stuff, uh, some of the Olympic lifts and things like that. The whole goal of all that is to build the most explosive, best connected athlete that we can possibly have. It's not necessary to be the strongest or certainly not the key to be the biggest. If it was about being the biggest and then no way Anthony Urban wins the 50 freestyle in the last Olympics because he was by far the smallest in the final of the 50 free. But, you know, power and explosiveness, water acumen, all sort of packaged up uh, and using a race strategy at the right time is the art of putting the whole thing together. But foundationally, given that especially with our young kids aren't being taught to, to, to jump and play in school, 
Uh, you cannot learn how to do that better by using your thumbs and, and, and playing, playing on the computer. You have to actually go outside and climb a tree and run down the street or play tackle football or do the things that we used to do. Well, well we have to bring that into the club program now and uh, with Coronado, with the younger kids, with Coronado Sim Association, with Team Elite Kids, we're uh, building in that athletic development on land and then bringing it to water. With the other end of it, with the professionals, it's much more individual. So we have a dry land coach, Ophir Gonin, who comes in twice a week, works with connection pieces. Yesterday I had them walking on stability balls and they're having to move the stability ball and step on the stability ball, move it again and then step on it just really playing balance games and, and uh, sort of athleticism games. And then, and then again, we bring that into the water. Usually right after we do dry land, we'll go right into the water and work on whatever we worked on on land. So if we're working on planks and core, then we'll do some uh, sort of turtle kicks where you'll keep, they'll try to keep their lower, their, their back flat and as high as it can be while they're moving. Uh, or just sculling drills where they're staying really high and paying particular attention to the lumbar spine that they don't have a big sway in it and really trying to set up their their uh, position in the water so that we can get the, so that we can swim through the least amount of water and cause them the least resistance because that's where most of the gains are going to be made is eliminating resistance not by increasing power so it, yes it's power but the power the goal of power is to help uh, develop a body and an athlete that knows how to manage their bodies in the water. Who slows down the least, right? And, right. and I see some of this as I look at this workout. And Javi, I'm going to have you explain to us what you're looking for when you do something like 425s, one fin, one paddle, connect. Talk to me about that set and, and what you're trying to develop there. For sure. So we're trying to, uh, we've been... Um, Sometimes I like to call it obnoxious about some details that we want to accomplish. So you cross section connection, your right, right arm, left fin connection, make sure you're hitting it in a proper way. Uh, and make sure, especially at the pro level, that they discover what it worked best for them. Okay, so I see, I see, I heard so much people talking about uh, this, it has to be the, the opposite fin, it has to be the same fin, it has to be this side this side so i want the athlete to discover that because it's their time is their brain is how they understand that and actually it was a very good conversation with anthony and christian uh just today during practice about how one how christian feels something and how anthony feels something but they are doing both the same thing you know so it's, for, it's time for them to discover things uh, i think that sometimes us coaches especially coaching uh like age level kids, we, we don't let them play too much. You know, I think the play time in the water is very valuable because as David is saying, we try to create a water skill all around athlete. You know, yes, you can swim pools back and forward, but we need to let them play in the water, let them realize why they move in the water in this way. So I think that's one of the things that keep David fresh uh, that David swimmers fresh because they're all the time playing or they're trying to do something very interesting thing. So uh, it's more about the connection and for them to realize this is what it feels to me. And then after they realize that on those 425, as they call going to 225 finesse, with I cut finesse is just in top of the water, close your eyes, dream that you're floating in top of the water, um, executing all the details you're supposed to execute. And that's the way that you swim. You don't have to be go all out or fast. But just make sure it's a nice, easy speed that you feel all your connection and everything fired up in the way that you're supposed to be to you, not what the coach is telling you to do or not what my friend is telling me to do. This is what it makes sense on my brain. I really like how you guys are engaging the mind. This is some cerebral practice. And uh, obviously, you know, it's, it's paying off and it's paid off in the program over the last couple of years. And it's been fun to watch. When I look at this workout, I see such attention to detail. Now, as coaches, we're always saying, you know, head down, flags to finish, 50, 100 free, head down, 12 and a half to the wall. It can get overwhelming for the athletes to hear it time and time and time again. How do we reinforce to our athletes, Coach Marsh, the, the importance of details? Because as coaches, we think we're reinforcing those ideas all the time. 
but but there might be a disconnect there into what they're actually hearing. So how, how do you engage your athletes to understand the significance of why doing the details matter so much? Yeah, I think a lot of times as coaches, we, we can tend to think that because we've taught it, they've learned it. And that's not true. You know, until, the, until a student has learned, you haven't taught as a coach which means that you know you may be thinking that, that saying something or showing it having somebody show an example of it is going to cover what you need well it, that might not do it they might need to work with each other in the water and see what's going on today we were working on some turns and i had uh, jacob pebbly go down underwater. water i couldn't see what he can see underwater but he's helping andy Mirez with a turn we we're trying to figure out she has a dead spot on her on her uh, underwater kicks coming just as she gets past the flags and so today we were experimenting with her uh, staying on her side a little bit longer. I can't see it. Jacob was underwater watching her and giving her feedback. So I guess that's part of the lesson is to understand, first of all, what is your priorities and what do you value? So if you value that, as, that you don't breathe the last five meters coming into a finish or breathe under the flags, then don't allow athletes to breathe under the flags ever. Like just make it that's your standard for the team is you can't breathe. Uh, we were doing some uh, 200 IMs descending today and Abe Devine was, came, came in on number three and it's supposed to be full speed. Well, he breathed under the flags. And so my uh, reminder to him was clearly that wasn't all out because you didn't breathe, you didn't hold your breath into the finish, you didn't charge the finish as you would in a race. So uh, we need to get this right. And so he went from a 213 to a 208, you know, long course through an IM from a push and practice this morning uh, a little bit because I got on him, but also just because he paid way more attention to the details and was up much more aggressive. So really it's that constant uh, explaining what you're looking for in a, in a big level. Like you can have, you can have, you know, standard policies. We always had a, a swim Mac or an Auburn university uh, 101. So here's the, on the 101 list, this is things we always do. And we don't ever not do. If you pull, you breathe bilateral. Uh, if you uh, pushing off a wall, you do six body dolphin kicks, you know, and early in the season, we do it every single wall. And then as the season goes, some of those things we might loosen up on, but you sort of reset the fundamentals every, in, a, in a rhythmic sense. It might be season to season, but probably even better if it's, you know, every cycle of training, you go back to some element of, of uh, fundamentals. Uh, so I think that's one of the ways to do it, Mike. And I, I think that, uh, uh, just the, the, the coaches, you know, paying uh, acute attention to it. And if you need to create a lane off the side where people aren't keeping up to, and then have a, have a coach uh, focus on just that one lane to get these people caught up so you can move on with the next group, you know, sometimes you need to do that. And I do think COVID has been tough time for, you know, the kids to have that play time in the water because most of us have very little time in the water. We've, we've had our time chopped up, uh, you know, at the pool we use here in La Jolla. And so we've actually had to take a 33 meter pull and put a line across the middle. And there are, we're doing a lot of our training back and forth to that line. Uh, so they, we have noticed they've gotten a lot better underwater kicking, but you know, we're not even getting 25 yards swimming in a lot of cases in practice to, to maximize uh, people in the water because we had to have, there's only allowed two per lane. So by splitting the lane, we had four in a lane. And, and as you know, when you're trying to make the finances work in a swim club, you can't make it with two in a lane and uh, pay for the rent. That's exactly right. And, you know, it brings up a great point because a lot of times, and I noticed this with some of our young assistants, and when I was coming up as an assistant, we get married to the sets that we write. And there might be a little switch in our brain that says, I got to get this piece, everything that's on my sheet, I got to get it done. Javi, when are there times that you know you have to say, look, this isn't going to work today? I got to come up with something quick here because this just isn't flowing with the way we want things to go. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I have the fortune to work for Sam and for David, and I, ha I had to learn to react to, okay, write a step for the next 20 minutes. I'm looking for this, 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 and that. So uh, I think the ideas that I come up with from what, see what the swimmers are not doing correctly on the spot, like the same day, okay, we need to do a little bit more discipline out of the wall, or we need to get a little more work on the hypoxic work. And from that, I designed the set. So sometimes it's from reading what you see in the water, like both David and Sam, uh, they do uh, their sets on the spot, depending on what they're feeling right there, because that's their coaching. Uh, I'm, I'm going a little bit more like prepare 
but on the spot, I will we'll be flexible to change things depending on what I see. So uh, read, read people, read your swimmers, and then react from it. Dave, do you have a micro cycle for the set? You, you were mentioning Mondays and Fridays the other day. It, it, made, it led me to believe that maybe you have an idea of what the week's going to look like. Is, is there a micro cycle that you have for the coaches that they're looking at? I mean, just generally a micro cycle I follow is pretty much the, the rule of twos. So, you know, two, two days a week, we do something that's uh, very challenging. And depending on the time of year we're in, it may be an, a big time aerobic challenge. It may be uh, like we're in now more of an anaerobic challenge. So two, two days a week of that, two days a week of speed. I, my programs always involve speed and speed in terms of the independent speed. So probably, you know, 16 to 20 all out bursts, 15 meter bursts with maybe a variety of equipment and a variety of strokes are done a different way. Uh, it, may it may involve these runners or things in and out of the water. Uh, out here in California, it does, even though it's beautiful, it does get cold as soon as the clouds come uh, cover the sun. So we have to sort of work with the weather. Uh, but uh, so two, two times uh, sort of the, the, the sort of the main sets of the week, two times a speed set, two times an aerobic component. And, you know, early in the year, the aerobic component might be, you know, along the lines of the, the 10 or 15 uh, 200 IMs. But usually we do a little bit more interesting than that. I, I, I get really bored by writing a set that looks like 10 200 IMs. Uh, so we'll have about 13 instructions. In fact, I was just looking at one of the sets I have here and it's a it's an NIM set that's got a bunch of, it looks, you know, like three, uh, three rounds of three 200s, but in reality, it's a bunch of chopped up stuff while you're going straight 200s. Uh, and then I'd say the other thing is the, with the, the older they get, the more you have to build recovery as the centerpiece of the, uh, of the, the, the microcycle in terms of the, the, the one the little one week window we're in. Uh, you know, what is, where's recovery going to come in? And it's a real challenge right now for us because we've, you know, again, with our, we've lost access to one of our pools and, and uh, we're, we're sort of driving a lot now. So their time uh, between going to the weight room and then driving to the pool has to be counted in the energy they're using in a, in a day. So these things we're having to sort of build in to make sure that they're getting some element of recovery. Just this morning, I was talking to Kathleen and, and Abe, and uh, Nastia after the practice, and we were talking about we, we want to now get to Friday and Saturday with energy. You know, historically, we try to drain the tank on Saturday. So whatever they show up with Saturday, we want to walk out of there, you know, just completely crushed. Uh, that's not the case anymore now. Now we want them to get to Friday and Saturday with energy and even leave Saturday, you know, on, on, you know walk onto the balls of their feet a little bit. Uh, so it depends on the time of season. But generally, there'll be a, a sort of a Tuesday, Thursday, or Tuesday, Friday, uh, high quality set. There'll be a Monday and Thursday, or Monday and Friday, aerobic, big aerobic piece. Uh, usually, we try to, for most of my, especially sprinters, Wednesday's been a pretty sacred day. Uh, wasn't today, but uh, we, that, that's a day when they, they do full recovery. And then around that, some of the presets will be the speed uh, elements. All the while, uh, you know, another rule of two would be two to at least two IM sets per week. So we're, you know, we're generally always doing, uh, even when I, you know, people were let, you know, thought it was crazy when I had Cullen Jones and, you know, he would do IM sets, you know, every week, you know, Anthony was swimming butterfly yesterday in practice. And that's not necessarily something he, he does very often, but these are things I believe that, you know, developing as an overall swimmer, one, it takes your attention off of the, you know, having to, focus on the details of your best stroke all the time. We do like them swimming their, the racing stroke in practice almost all the time. And so sending them off on another stroke can help with uh, uh, allowing them to sort of be freed up just to give a, a good effort rather than how the stroke looks. Absolutely. And, and one of the things that I know you've also done from uh, some of the research that I've done leading up to this is I had a conversation with Brett Hawk and I said, Brett, what, what are some of the real challenging sets? You remember sprint sets that Coach Marsh gave you? He said, Coach Marsh never gave me a sprint set, but he gave us a lot of really hard team sets. <laughs> so what was the reason at Auburn for some of those team sets? I know that you had a specific rationale behind them. Why was that so important to the development of the athletes and the program? Well, because the college is a team and, uh, and, and they need to see each other, you know, 
exerting the effort. Uh, you know, one of the sets that we used to do, I wrote it down here before this call, because it's one of my favorite ones that sort of happened out of, I was sort of frustrated that we hadn't been doing, you know, all the, 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 the enough stuff at the speed that we're going to race. We just did 120 25s, put the timing system up. So we started on the 30 second interval. And after 20, we dropped the interval two seconds. And then the, 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 it would keep dropping you down to where you're doing. And if you missed one, uh, you did, I think you did sat out one and then you had to do butterfly on the next two sort of punishment for not, uh, now age group coaches, I don't encourage you to punish for butterfly. These are college athletes. And so we sort of could toy around with a little bit of butterfly and it's a 25 butterfly. So it wasn't killer, but it, it, uh, sort of made those that made it through the whole set hitting their times. They're sort of the heroes. They could, they could knock it out. Now sprint, of course, we had to build in a little protection for them because, you know, Brett and the, the sprint guys, they, they, uh, they, they, they weren't going to make, you know, 120 in a row, but their times were faster. So it was, they didn't get to do 200 pace. They had to do a uh, second 50 of 100 pace, but they just did a few less of them, but happened all together. So they'd be, you know, cheering for each other and then doing some sets with the, the men and women together. Most of our workout was, was, uh, wasn't broken out in the men's versus women, but there'd be times we'd break out the women and break out the men in different sets. And the, basically the women can handle, a little bit more of a, an intense load, especially at that max VO2 level than the men can. The men will, the men will generally be more in, in ma uh, lactate maximum uh, or lactate tolerance, whereas the women can handle max VO2 a lot better as a team. So those are things that we would do. And, and a lot of it had to do with the, the, uh, the team coming together, but also it had to do with just getting the, the effort uh, exertion that was needed. And when everybody's working hard at the same time, that certainly pays dividends in terms of building that team culture. Uh, Javi, when you're working for a Hall of Fame coach, you know, you might feel some, some pressure to make sure that you are on, firing on all cylinders at every workout. And I think that that's something that a lot of young assistant coaches go through and even young first time head coaches. How have you been kind of able to manage that? And I, and I know that David is one of the best at mentoring young coaches, but it can be a lot of pressure working in a program like that with, with somebody who is so well-known. How have you managed that? Um, <laughs> of course, it was kind of difficult at the beginning to process, but I think um, I, had, I had this conversation. Actually, David was there and David Durham was there and we were in Mar Nostrum before I was even a coach. I was a swimmer myself. And, and we were in Mario Nostrum and then one of my buddies, Corey today asked uh, David Dern a question like, what make a good assistant coach? And then, and then David Dern say like, do the things that nobody else wants to do. Like get there early, organize everything, make look every pretty, make sure the, cl the clocks are synchronized, make sure the power rack is ready, make sure the starting block is ready. So all the little things that when David walks in, there is a, whiteboard and a marker somewhere ready to write down a set because my job technically is help David give the best practice for our athletes. So that, that's number one, do the little things that they're indispensable to do for a, for a head coach. And then, yeah, just, I think that's one of the main things that keeps me alive. And then both of David and Sam, they were all uh, creative brands, brains. So I have to feel more in the, uh, fill up the blank on the organization part, you know, so I'm the one organizing of the, like the glue of the team trying to get everything organized. So those two little things, I think help everybody and, and trust and believe yourself, you know, you are there for a reason and, and you have to believe that you're there for that reason. Just keep on, keep on going. I love it. And you, and you're, you, you're seeing the artistic side of coaching and, and that that's something that's going to help you so much in your career. I got one more question for Coach Marsh, and then I'm going to do a quick fire questions for you to finish up, guys, both of you. Um, but the first question, and Javi, if you want to weigh in on this too, please do. You know, th this is something in the esoteric zone of coaches that we think about often, but we might not have a, a great idea of it. But I'm interested in your opinion, Coach Marsh. We yeah. all know that talent, work ethic, maturity, determination, they all play a role in elite level success. But what do world-class athletes, in your opinion, do better than everybody else? Two things, I would say. I would say they're the best world-class swimmers are unusually eager. Uh, you know, when I, when I just listened to uh, 
uh, Duncan talk about his 200 freestyle. And I know Tom Dean uh, sort of through knowing uh, his sister was the swam at Duke with Alyssa, uh, having coached Kathleen since she's, you know, 14 years old. Uh, I, you see the, and, it, and it's, it's, it's comes out in different ways. I mean, a sprinter is not going to have the same sort of, uh, you know, I ca Kathleen today asked in the workout, the beginning workout, you know, what's the, what's the set today? Cause I have a caffeine pill here. If I'm going to do something really hard, I want to take caffeine pill, you know, and then she, and then she said, and then she says, and I have a racing suit. If we're going to do something really fast, I want to put the rest of the racing suit on. So it's, you know, it's sort of like, here she is, how many years into this and the, the, the especially the ride she's had with, uh, with Crohn's and with, uh, you know, some of the injuries she's had and she's still this eager. Okay. So that's one thing. And then I'd say attention to detail. I mean, the, I think the other thing is, is they're, Oh, the, the, I'm not talking about just a world-class athlete. I'm talking about the, the world-class of the world, the tip of the spear, the people who are earning medals at the Olympics or fighting for those medals. They're doing something different than those that are just really good and, you know, want to, uh, you know, be, you know, make the next national team or want to go on trips and make the ISL league and things like this. People who are at the tip of the spear, yes, they have to have some level of talent. But a whole lot more of it is that they're more often paying attention to detail. That includes their living, the way they live, the way they think, and the way they come to practice and execute. Uh, Javi, uh, just uh, whether it be fortunate or unfortunate, got stuck in Sweden for a while. He was at a competition over there. And uh, he got to hang out with Johan over there, one of the best coaches in the world, and watch Sarah Sostrom, Michelle Coleman, and that group train for an extended period of time. And that's one of the comments, and I'll let them tell you about that a little bit, but one of the comments was, uh, yeah, okay, Sarah's a lot like Kathleen, you know, and that's, and, and, I, and I think that's what you see at that level is just, there's this engine going on in them that's, that's uh, insatiable. And I think for club coaches that are watching this, this broadcast is we've got to be careful to not coach that out of people, you know, like the, the people that have that kind of eagerness uh sometimes they get they can be a little obnoxious like they're they're they're, they're people who that you know you just want to say hey, just calm down calm down calm down no well you know they're excited they don't want to calm down uh you know they're, they want and, and so they don't, sometimes they'll get there early kathleen used to get to practice back at swim mac an hour before practice just to watch the, the older kids practice so she might learn something and so some some places we wouldn't allow the younger kid to come in the pool and watch well that'd be a big mistake because as a talent code one of the books that everybody needs to be reading uh, says is that 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 ignition that idea of, of, of seeing the future and what they can do and being excited about that that leaning into it what the, what young people look uh, glare at or stare at or or gaze at those are things that that uh, when special moments are happening they're really uh, forming their uh, heart's desire and that inner fire is getting stoked at that at that time and we want to do things that help stoke that inner fire not squash it with uh you know with the uh, you know i wouldn't say discipline but what with too much structure or really boring practices where a talented kid quits uh we want to keep things to where we keep the, the those those sort of sparky kids in our sport and uh and that, uh, to me a lot of times they turn out to be our best athletes i love it javi anything to add on that uh, i think just similar to what david said just uh they also think that they're the best like you, you tell them something and like uh, that looks pretty good. Like, yes, I know. Like, I understand that. Like, I understand that. I'm the best at that. So, and, and it happens. It happens to me when I was in Sweden. It happens to me here in Team Elite a lot. Uh, it's not that I have the vast experience as David has, but the, the little amount of when I was in ISL, I was handling also a lot of those athletes, and they were all like, "Yes, I know. It's good." They're like, "All right, I love it." <laughs> All right, guys, here we go. We got the quick fire questions. So uh, the, you guys can both weigh in on these. Will it take a sub 21 second performance in Tokyo to win the men's 53? No. Javi, no? No. Will the eight minute barrier go down in the women's 800 free? You know, <laughs> Javi, answer it first. <laughs> Uh, I say uh, no. Okay. I'm looking at I'm looking where it falls in the program because if it's if it's further for the up, it's later in the program. I would say no. Er, early, I think it's possible. But later in the program, uh, the the people in the that have a chance to do that are going to be racing a lot of races before that. 
It's it's a lot. I mean, talk to me real quick, guys, about, you know, the 50 is one of the later events. It's the last event. Do you think we'd see some faster swims if we had that event earlier in the meet? I do. I do. And I, and I remember vividly in uh, the trials for Rio, the last day uh, had Madison Kennedy, who uh, I thought it was in, in, in a great situation to make the team in, in the 50 freestyle. I think she was one of the best two sprinters that was, that was in the women's field. Uh, but the last day of trials, last day of Olympic games, you know, the, the medley relay few people and the 50 few people, they're sort of there by themselves. So you go this whole week where you the, almost the whole team's coming to the pool together. They're in the team area. They're doing this, they're doing that. Well, you get toward the end of the week and nobody's back there. They're all sleeping in till 10 in the morning or they're, uh, you know, off, on to the next thing at the Olympics. They're off trying to get uh, their, their free headphones or whatever the things that they're giving away different places. So you sort of lose a little bit of that energy. So you have to have, be really good at figuring out how to manage that at the end of a, at the end of a program. And that's one of the things I'd say the U.S. Olympic team did really well last time is we ask everybody to stay fully engaged all the way through and with uh, leadership like, you know, Elizabeth Beisel, Michael Phelps, that did happen. And that's one of the reasons we finished so well. And, uh, you know, when Anthony won the 50, it was like, you know, there was no less energy in the team area that morning he arrived for the 50 freestyle. So uh, it's a great question, actually. And, and I do think the, the 50 free, I would say, but not because of the effort and energy. I think it's more because of the, the, the energy of the environment of the, of the of event overall. Uh, and I don't think it's one of those events that, gets faster at the end of a program because you sort of throw caution to the wind. Uh, some of the 200s and 100s can do that. You know, you notice at NCAA is there's some amazing swims the last day, the last evening of the last of the meet when they should be exhausted, but yet they pop some huge swims because they're just mentally relaxed. And we can never short sell the importance of the mental part of performance because it's the most important as the meets get bigger, it's way more important than the physical part or even the, even the strategic part it's, uh, at times. No doubt about it. Uh, Coach Marsh, why is ASCA so important for coaches today? Well, because it's the one group that focuses on coaches and specifically club coaches, I would say, even more so. I mean, I'm a, I was a college coach and a, and a club coach and a pro coach. So I've done the full, you know, I guess, rainbow of coaching. And uh, it's been the one place I can go back and know that uh, the, the, the advocacy for, uh, not coaches, but if you're advocating for coaches, you're advocating for the sport, for the future development of the sport, because we all are interested in what's best for the long-term future of our sport. If you're a professional coach, that should be part, at least a portion of your energy should go toward, how do I make the sport better for everybody in the sport? And uh, by, by, you know, Mike, by asking these kind of questions and hopefully getting this uh, recording and people can listen to this, hopefully a few people pick up a few tips or thoughts that will help them. But this is the kind of thing that ASCA does. And then it's put into format. So I'm very excited with Jennifer Lamont coming aboard as, as our uh, executive director. Uh, she has some of the skills, I think, to organize us and, and really put, put us in the right positions to maximize the next, uh, the next iteration of what ASK is going to look like, and it is going to look a little bit, lot different. And uh, we get, we, you know, we're going to move in technology. We're going to move in, in uh, uh, some of the utilization of the, the, the great minds we have, like Bob Grosseth and Peter Lynn and people like that. And this, this is going to allow our young coaches, the motivated young coaches especially, to figure out how to, how to be the best coach they absolutely can be. And Javier is one of the examples of that. He's an outstanding young coach who's developing. Uh, literally by the day uh, and he got the starting block on the on the blocks yesterday before practice so good job Javi. <laughs> <laughs> all right I've been uh, excited to ask this question you know you mentioned Madison Kennedy what a great job being elite for such a long time um, what what is one of the athletes that you coached coach Marsh that you believe could have been world class in any other sport I would say uh, Cullen Jones and, and when I say that Cullen not only because his Athletic, athletic size, but also because his, his competitive fire. And he's one of these guys that, that just has a, a sort of an insatiable uh, 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 competitiveness about him. Whether it be, they, they could be playing card games and he has to win the card game. You know, if, if we did sprint 
15 meters. He never lost a sprint 15 meter his entire time. I had him when I was coaching him. He, he won every single one. And, I, and I, even if I said, no, you didn't win. He goes, oh, no, I won. I, my, my hand touched first for sure. So, you know, I, I'd say that's, that's a lot of why that happened. <laughs> Javi, how can people in the San Diego area find out about you guys and learn more about your program and, and join your program? Absolutely. Uh, for sure. I think Instagram is pretty easy to do. We try to be as uh, update or, you know, daily daily basis everything that we do on instagram for sure and then uh our uh, team elite aquatics uh dot com so we actually have a phone uh fundraiser uh june 23rd coming up for those going to trial so we we are heavily involved uh the people here in san diego to look up for us and how we can help the san diego swimming Fantastic. Javier Sosa, Coach Dave Marsh, thank you guys so much for your time today. This episode will be available late tonight or early tomorrow morning, depending on what time I get home from practice.